for all the parents listening in who want to raise anti-racist children, who want to raise children who are deeply empathic, uh, I guess your advice as a dad uh, to to other dads and other moms on how to raise up, I guess, empathic children. You know, it's been a journey for me. It's something that, that I, I think and pray over often um, is we have made these topics front and center conversations in the life of our family. And some of that is because of just the, the, the times that we're in, um, especially living in Washington, D.C., uh, with things erupting all last year and everything. There's no way uh, you really have to try hard not to have your kids engaged in the real world in which they're growing up. Uh, to not address race these days, which maybe itself is part of the answer to the question. <laughs> like, don't deny it. Don't shelter your kids in a way uh, that's uh, really um, unhealthy for them. Um, but from an early age, we raised our kids with an awareness of racial realities, beginning with their own identity. Um, you know, some of this is uh, taken from African American sociologists that point this out. You know that it's kids notice difference in skin color and race far earlier than we think. It's actually the, the parents, the grown ups, that are stifling their exploration of that because we're uncomfortable with it. Um, but foster it, you know, unleash it. Um, but it, it also means talking, for instance, with our kids about their Korean American identity, teaching them to celebrate it, and then teaching them to notice differences. Um, I think one thing, for example, that we've had to keep our eye on as we teach our kids about civil rights history or, you know, they're still young, but we're pushing it on them, uh, right? Uh, as they learn about um, the brokenness of even our present and the realities of racism is to make sure that we are balancing that, for example, with uh, stories of black joy and dignity so that they're not actually incidentally uh, being uh, sort of cultivating this this picture of blackness as only tragic and sorrowful. Um, and of course, that means they need to not just be reading books about this stuff, they need to be befriending black friends and hanging out with their buddies and, and experiencing that as like, hey, you know, your your friend, they are, they, they are who they are. These are real people that we're talking about. So exposing them in relationships like that, sending them to schools where there's diversity, at least enough for them to encounter people with difference um and so that they're having to practice that on a daily basis and then debriefing constantly um in the home and uh, again addressing it very deliberately and intentionally what would you say greg um I, it's a great question and and i certainly don't think i'm a paradigm for how to do this um i would say that generally we we haven't raised our kids with explicitly like anti-racist um language I think, I mean, obviously doing what I do and studying the things that I study, I mean, they've seen portraits of King and African-American art and stuff all over our house. And <clears throat> we moved them to Memphis um, so they get, so we could be in this particular community um, and do the work. And so I think we've been, we've, we've been putting things in front of them um, all, all the while. But I think what we really want for our children is, is one, for them to be deeply committed to the work of love in their lives, that they understand that their their lives are here to love God and to love their neighbor in everything that they do. And then secondly, to have the capacity to do that contextually. Um, and that requires us for, that has required us to expose our kids to the world as we find it, as it is, um, and not um, this, the kind of like highly manicured version um, that it, that they that many people like to believe, and so I think that one of the things that has been interesting is my kids are getting older. Um, watching them is like they are themselves taking up the work of love, and now <clears throat> because they've learned about the world, and they and we haven't sheltered them from any of that, they're now take, taking up their own improvisations of love. And mm -hmm. I think giving them the freedom to know your work is love, your place is here. Now you figure it out. And I, I think w w the reason that feels important to me is that um, I think a paint by numbers sort of growing kids God's way sort of version of moral formation actually constrains the theological imagination. It constrains the moral imagination because it, it makes children afraid to take risks. Um, and I don't know what else cruciform love is but that. 
uh, taking a risk on behalf of your neighbor. And so I think there has to be a freedom, obviously an urging to love a deep education about context, but also a freedom to experiment and to try to into what love, what shape is love going to take? And what did you learn from that? And how can we grow and how can we try it again? Um, and so that, that requires them to renounce fear um, because fear, as you know, drives out love. Hey, thank you so much for checking out this video clip from the Dogato podcast. To get more videos like this, simply subscribe here on YouTube. You can also download the full episode of each show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or your favorite podcast player. Take care.